Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I guess it's become afternoon now. Get a little bit of water here before we get started. Um, I, it's an honor to talk with you all here today and to also be uh, part of another talk uh, here at the archives. I've given talks on the Civil War before, usually on military topics. This, is, uh, this talk will be on politics in Alabama, specifically the 1863 election. And this is, as Alex alluded to, um, is drawn out of my current research. In fact, what you're going to get here is a, like a whirlwind summary of a lot of, a lot of the political findings uh, that, I, that I've uh, come across in looking at this election. It's an important election uh, in that it's coming at the, the midpoint of the war, 1863, uh, two, two years into the conflict. And so it's an important election that, that to a certain extent, enables uh, a historian like myself and, and anyone else to gauge popular support for the war uh, to a certain extent. Uh, what, what, you know, people can certainly write letters and, and the newspapers can certainly present views on, on the course of the war, uh, but when, when citizens can actually vote, they, they, they are directly participating in the political process that got their state, in this case, into the conflict, and they can weigh in with a direct opinion. And so I'm, you know, that's what I want to look at. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about all of a big sweep. There's the congressional elections, there's the gubernatorial election, there's the state elections uh, for all the legislators, uh, and then there's the Senate elections. And you know, we'll see how, how far I can get through all of that. Uh, I'm violating a tenant of a professor of mine in graduate school who always said, do more with less. I'm going to do less with more. Um, <laughs> This is also an, uh, an overlooked election, too. I don't think a lot, it's not an election that's been studied very closely. It gets mentioned in some of the histories of Alabama during the period, and many of the individuals, politicians involved, get some coverage. But certainly the election of 1860, the election of Lincoln, is a, is a monumentally important election that, that, that triggers the secession crisis. And then, then you have the war, and then the war ends, and we forget that there was, there was a political process taking place here, not just in Alabama, but, but states North North and South conducted uh, state-level elections in the midst of, of, this, of this conflict. The uh, quote I have here, um, the South can't stop and the North won't, is from Augustus Benners. He is a pro-war legislator and slaveholder from Greene County. Big slaveholder. He's got about 90 slaves. And so the, and, and, I'm, and, and all these politicians I'm going to talk about, I, I don't want to, want to dwell on it explicitly, but I want, to, I want to point out that while there is difference of opinion about whether the Confederacy should, or the, rather, whether Alabama should read, uh, uh, continue its commitment to the cause, to the rebellion, there's disagreement politically. The one thing that, that we will find consensus with, with every politician that I show up on the screen today, is they're all strong advocates of protecting the peculiar institution, the institution of slavery. Many of them are planters, almost all of them are slaveholders. Uh, but with Benners here, this quote, that the North can't and the South, well, in some ways, it, it captures the prevalent mindset of, of Alabama, Alabamians in general, certainly Alabama voters in 1863, and, and, and Benners is essentially, he wrote this in his journal, uh, but he expressed the sentiment in, in other venues. He's, he's saying, we've come too far. We've got to see this thing through. The North, the enemy, certainly isn't going to stop. So when you go to the polls, you might as well vote for men who are going to press on for victory, because uh, we're not going to get any mercy uh, from, the, from the North. Okay. The uh, political military situation does not bode well for Alabama. If you're going to hold an election, August 3rd, 1863 is the worst time to hold it. If you're a pro-war candidate wanting, to, wanting to, to, you know, promote the case for fighting on to the bitter end against the enemy, uh, Alabama and the rest of the Confederacy are undergoing what I call total war policies, uh, where the, the Confederate government in Richmond, but also in Montgomery, are... are centralizing authority, uh, mobilizing all of the uh, resources, human and material, uh, for the war effort. And some of the policies that are, have already been passed going into the election, so when the voters go to the polls, uh, they, they know how, they're, how the incumbent or uh, many of the politicians stand on these issues. You've got conscription, um, very uh, controversial decision that was made, uh, though 
had a great deal of, of uh, political support. Suspension, that's suspension of habeas corpus uh, in selected areas of the South uh, through with congressional approval. Uh, Jefferson Davis uh, suspended habeas corpus, which basically means that the military can arbitrarily arrest people without cause, hold them in for indefinite periods of time. It's a violation of civil liberties, very, also very controversial. Impressment, uh, impressment of private property by the, by the government, uh, either the national government or the state government, uh, any form of property, the military, if the military sees it as need, being militarily necessary to prosecute the war effort, they will appropriate um, mules, livestock, uh, slaves are oftentimes impressed with caveats, uh, certain quotas and time periods, but also very controversial, especially since the institution of slavery is so near and dear to the socioeconomic foundation of the Confederacy. And the tax in kind, uh, a government policy uh, because of the fact that the paper currency of the Confederacy was becoming fast useless uh, with inflation as the government was uh, taxing its citizenry uh, based on uh, 10% of their produce, 8% of, of mechanized produced goods, uh, something something hard and tangible. If you, there's no point in taxing the people and asking for them to pay uh, Confederate banknotes or state banknotes because those are useless. The government pays the army in useless currency, but it does not uh, receive it through the taxation policy. It wants something real and substantial. So those total war policies are a backdrop to going into the election. Uh, making great demands and calling on the, on the people to sacrifice, but there's also battlefield setbacks. Uh, the military situation is taking a, a, a nose dive in the summer of 1863. Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia has been uh, badly defeated at Gettysburg, you know, approximately 25,000 casualties. And at about the same time, uh, Vicksburg, uh, the great Confederate citadel on the Mississippi River, has fallen to Ulysses S. Grant. And with the fall of the river, uh, the, the, the uh, Confederacy has lost, has lost uh, uh, contact in many respects with, uh, with, with the states on the other side. Alabama's electorate. I want to say something here. It is an election, and, and, and this is a caveat I, I put in my, in my research, which I'm hoping to get published as a, as a book, is that this election really is not a, a, a clean, clear-cut gauge of Alabama society's commitment to the war, uh, which is you know, over a million people, men, women, slave, free, uh, young and old. But those who are participating, it's really a study of the polity uh, of Alabama, of those who have a political voice, the office holders, military personnel, and then the electorate, which is adult white males only, uh, 21 years of age. <laughs> That's who's voting. And as I'll get to as I, at various points uh, in my talk, this does not include the soldiers. There's about 30,000 uh, Alabama soldiers uh, who, who are on active duty at the time of the election away from their home precinct and the Constitution forbids them to participate in the election. There's no absentee ballot. So, and as I, as I have found out in my research, uh, the majority of soldiers are strongly pro-war. Uh, they want to they fight. Those that are still in the ranks at this point want victory. And they want politicians who want victory, but they do not get to participate in the election, uh, which is quite frustrating for them. So we're really left out of the potential uh, adult white male pool, taking out the soldiers, taking out the 10 to 15,000 who've already died at this point, taking out displaced uh, quasi-refugees who can't get to the poll or areas uh, that have been overrun by, by Union forces, usually up in the Tennessee River Valley. You've got about uh, 35, 39,000 people that participate. 35,000 vote in the congressional races. They're all held at the same time, but some people don't vote for everybody. Uh, and the congressional uh, uh, races only got 35,000 votes. For the governor, it was 39,000. Regardless, about only about one-third of a narrowly defined electorate participates in the process, and so it's, one has to be careful to draw too many sweeping conclusions here about Alabama society's view of the war, uh, and instead, we, but we can, we can draw some conclusions about the polity, uh, the, those that have political voice in Alabama. Do they, they're the ones that plunge the Alabama into the secession crisis in the first place, that are waging this total war, do they still want to continue on? And that's, that's the question, going to the polls on, on the 3rd of August. Uh, Pro-war, anti-war, pro-peace, um, who cares about the issues of the 1850s now? Do we want to win, or do we want to come up with some kind of negotiated peace settlement with the North? 
And speaking of that peace settlement, I meant to have it as a bullet up here. <clears throat> there is a growing secretive group called the Peace Society in Alabama, but it's, it pervades other parts of the South where there is a, it, it's not an official political party, um, but it, it is an, a, a loosely organized anti-war group that's trying to sow the seeds of discontent whenever elections come around and, and encouraging voters to elect men who will call for a ceasefire and, and enter into negotiations with the Lincoln administration. Whereas someone like Augustus Benners, who I just mentioned, totally opposed to that. We're fighting it out to the end. All right. This is a, a congressional map of Alabama. All the counties. I don't know how well you can see them all up here. But uh, there were nine under the under the Confederacy. Confederate Alabama has nine congressional districts. What are we down to now? Six. I mean, seven. I think the census might take one away after 2020. But uh, the Confederate Alabama has nine, uh, running roughly north to south. District one. Uh, and it's oddly, it's one, two, then back up three, four, over here five, six, seven, down eight, over here nine. Uh, those, those, are the, those are the districts. The shading has, uh, is only to uh, provide a, a more visual, uh, sharper differentiation between the regions. Although certainly one could, could say that the slave districts are more pronounced down south, uh, less so up north, although the Tennessee River Valley has a substantial slave population. Um, but, that, but that's just uh, for reference, uh, so you see where everything is. There's Montgomery at the Capitol. Uh, and speaking of the congressional districts, I want to plunge into the congressional races. And again, these are just snapshots here. I, I, I don't have time to go into the, the detail, mul multiple studies, uh, detailed studies I'll do in, in my current work. I mean, I'm going to have an entire chapter on the congressional races, an entire chapter on the gubernatorial race, and so forth. But this is a, a, a snapshot of the Congress. And these are, I start with the congressional race because these are the, the individuals who are actively involved in passing those total war policies, enacting them at the national level that all the states have to comply with. Uh, and first, uh, to give you a, orient you to the map, as we say, so to speak, say in the military, uh, any name of the nine districts, any name in bold, that's the winner. Uh, that's the guy who won the race. Um, the names in italics, uh, like Fa uh, Thomas Foster, Marcus Gruick Shank, uh, William Til uh, Chilton, and Francis Lyon, for instance, those are former Whigs, the Whig Party. The others are Democrats. Except former Democrats, except for this oddball, William R. Smith. This gentleman right here is, is the wild card in Alabama's delegation. Uh, every, every state has a politician that doesn't conform to uh, one way or the other, one side or the other. Uh, he's a, a political independent. Sometimes he was once a Democrat, once a Whig, then, it, then he was a know-nothing, then an independent. Uh, there was one party he absolutely hated that he said he would never join, and that was the Republican Party of the North. Uh, that was the anti-slavery party, the party of Lincoln, the party waging the war against the Confederacy. Virtually every Confederate politician hates the Republican Party, uh, certainly in Alabama. Um, but the reason why I stress former Whig and former former Democrat, and I, that the operative word is former, is there is um, there are studies in, in Civil War historiography that try to make the case that the Whigs of the South were generally opposed to secession, or and then when secession occurred, they were lukewarm supporters of the Confederacy. Uh, that may be true for other states, but what I have found is it really doesn't apply to Alabama, that the that former Whigs could be just as gung-ho for the war and just as strong for secession as the so-called fire-eating Democrats. Uh, so it, it became more a matter of, regard, it didn't matter what your former political affiliation was, where did you stand on the war question in 1863? Uh, which, again, talking about prevailing uh, Civil War historiography that I'm running a bit counter to, is the argument is this election is an indication that Alabama is kind of sliding into defeatism. Um, no. I, I, when I'm done with this, it's, it, it, it remains, uh, with some misgivings, with some caution, a generally pro-war uh, Confederate state. But briefly going down, down the line here, I don't want to belabor all of that, uh, you know, the other photographs here. This is Smith from from the from. Well, you can see Foster runs unopposed. So, uh, and he's a pro-war, pro-war politician. Um, everyone except Smith votes for conscription. 
uh, when, 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 when that came up. Everybody except Smith and Rawls, who was absent on the day of the vote, voted for impressment, for instance. Um, six of them vote for attacks in kind. Five voted for suspension of habeas corpus. There were a few, like uh, Jabez Curry, that thought that was, that was pushing presidential authority too strongly, even though they understood the rationale behind it. Uh, but uh, for most of those total war policies that either enjoyed near, near uh, unanimous support from Alabama's delegation or majoritarian support for those war policies. Uh, Foster wins unopposed. The second district here, Smith will win, uh, even though he was sometimes vilified as the, the curmudgeon who couldn't make up his mind whether he really was for the Confederacy or not. He, he, he voted abstentia a lot. Um, couldn't bring himself to vote for or against, just, just kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't really like it either way. Um, he's running up against uh, William Fowler, who was a battery commander uh, in the Army of Tennessee. And a newspaper man from, former newspaper man from Tuscaloosa, who's definitely pro-war. As you see here, the asterisks indicate men who had, who had military service in the Confederate Army. Uh, as we'll see as we go through, there are several others. Having, mili having credentials in the military, or in the Confederate military, did not help you win elections in 1863. After the Civil War, you have to have credentials in the Confederate military if you want to win elections in Alabama, but it's not, not, not so much the case during the war, although it didn't hurt. Uh, and it certainly helped clarify where many of these guys stood. Fowler is very much pro-war, but he loses to, to Smith. Um, and I'll get in, I'll, you know, I wanna, when I'm done, I'm gonna offer an explanatory for why some of these elections turn out the way they do. Third district is a controversial one. It involves, uh, the winner is this gentleman here, Williamson Cobb, who is a well-known unionist. He held the seat for seven terms before the secession. Then he lost to Rawls, John P. Rawls from Cherokee County, who's a pro-war uh, slaveholder from Cherokee County. Um, Cobbs wants to come back and get his seat. Uh, he hates the, he, of all these politicians, he, he's probably the one that despises the Confederacy more than anything else. He wants the Confederacy to lose. He's a unionist. He collaborates with the federal forces that move into the uh, northern Alabama. And he's running not so much because he wants to serve the Confederacy. He just wants to deprive uh, Rawls of his seat. And he does win, and he never takes his seat. He never goes to Richmond. He just wins. And then, and, and, and then this, uh, within a year, he's dead. Um, there is some strong indication that he was assassinated by uh, uh, Confederate partisans for his... You know, anti-Confederate sentiments. But you can see it's a, it's a three-way race here. Uh, Cobb wins with a plurality. He did not win a majority, he won a plurality. Uh, some historians looking casually at the election say, well, Cobb won, Cobb's a unionist, therefore that district is, is opposed to the Confederacy. Uh, yes, there's a substantial uh, element of the population that has misgivings about the Confederacy, but it's a plurality. Uh, the other two combined uh, are, um, outnumber him uh, Rawls is definitely pro-war, but so is James Sheffield. He's the active colonel of the 48th Alabama, fresh off the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he wanted to make sure that that seat was retained by somebody with good, clean credentials and on the pro-war camp. And uh, it, I, had, I engage in some carefully constructed counterfactuals at times in my, in my research where had the soldiers, several thousand soldiers from the, sec, uh, the third district do not participate in the election, but, when you, but they, they strongly support Sheffield. They would like to have seen him win. If Rawls could have stepped aside, Sheffield had run and the soldiers had been allowed to vote, there's a very good chance Sheffield would have won that seat and retained the district as a pro, pro, pro war, pro Confederate district, as opposed to what it became, kind of an empty seat under, under Cobb. Uh, the third, the fourth district is, is probably the most high profile of them all. If you read studies of the Civil War and it talks about elections and it gets to Alabama, it's invariably going to talk about this one because this is the, the most uh, sensational of the, of, the, of the races. Because Jabez Curry, who as you can see, loses. He, is the, he was the incumbent. He's a pro-war Democrat. He was, before the war, a, a champion of, of protecting the institution of slavery. Uh, it was, it would love to give speeches about, about uh, defending slavery before the war and during the war. Lacked to give speeches about we got to fight on to the bitter end. He votes for uh, all those total, most of those total war measures. He had misgivings about habeas corpus. Otherwise, he's all in. And he's defeated. 
um, by a man who was affiliated with the Peace Society, Marcus Kruikshank, uh, a, a virtual uh, obscurity from Talladega County, a, a local local newspaper man uh, upended. And it, this was the stunning one. This one got coverage across the South and up North. And this is the one that a lot of uh, people then and scholars look at since to say, well, this shows that Alabama uh, was was not was not uh, in favor of the Confederacy. They were sliding out. Um, if you just focus on, and there's Curry, by the way, uh, that's Jabez Curry, 37 years old, uh, the youngest, young, one of the youngest members in the Confederate Congress. Uh, the argument is, if you just focus at this, you could draw that conclusion. But I insist in my work, you got to look at all nine, and you have to look at all of the elections to try to come up with a better indication of where the electorate, albeit a small percentage of Alabama society, uh, views the question. But there's no doubt his defeat is a, is a blow to the pro-Confederate view. The rest of them are all safely won by uh, pro, pro-war politicians. We've got uh, Francis Lyon, wins in a landslide. He's a, well, he's, there he is right here. Uh, about 180 slaves. He's one of the biggest slaveholders from Alabama. Uh, crushes his opponent. Interestingly, the argument of uh, the impressment policy where the government could take slaves, uh, with lots of slaveholders were unhappy about that. He votes for that. He's a big slaveholder. He ponied up his slaves for, for uh, impressment as needed, and he wins in a landslide. Uh, Chilton, this guy, William Chilton from Montgomery, uh, also comfortably wins. Uh, these, these, these other people are largely obscurities. Uh, Clopton, I don't have an image of him, uh, from um, Macon County uh, near Tuskegee. Uh, he wins. His, this was a, actually an interestingly close election. Kate, John Cadenhead, is, uh, of, of all of them, is probably the most obscure challenger to the, to the incumbents, the pro-war incumbents. And uh, he, comes, he comes within a few hundred votes of, of upending Clopton. And I'm still looking into that one. I'm trying to figure, you know, we don't, I don't know practically nothing about this guy, whether he was pro-war or not, I'm, just, I'm, I'm surmising that he probably leaned against the war since everybody knew Clopton was for the war. But, but there's no guarantee of that. Anyway, Clopton holds his seat. The eighth, a lot of folks running here, uh, which creates lots of chaos and confusion. No clear-cut winner. Uh, James Pugh, here he is right here, will win. Uh, owner of 60 slaves, hardcore, fire-eating um, Democrat, part of the Eufaula Regency in that part of, part of the state. Uh, he votes for every total war policy that comes across the floor of Congress and will continue to do so after he's reelected. Everybody knows where he stands. He wins the plurality uh, because you got so many people running. Uh, Stark is the military guy, 15th Alabama. He comes in last in the four-way race. These other two in the middle, Jones and Wiley. Uh, Wiley is against the war. Jones, I'm suspecting, might be as well. Uh, but they divide the vote. Had they collaborated, you might have, you might have actually seen had the anti-war. There's no political parties. Let me step back for a second. There's no political parties in the Confederacy. So when I talk about pro-war and anti-war, these are these are political sentiments, uh, outlooks, views. There's no official party around which to coalesce these these ideas. Like up north, you got the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, and they formalize party agendas. You don't have anything like that in the South. It's more it's a kind of personality politics. Um, had there been official parties. Uh, I think Cobb would have lost here, but maybe Pew would have lost in the 8th. But the 8th eighth, eighth district has wiregrass counties in it. Um, and the regions of, the, of Alabama that are, if there's, you know, where there's lukewarm support for the Confederacy or for secession, and where the slaveholding numbers are small, it's the Hill counties <clears throat> up in uh, the 3rd and 4th district. So that helps account for these outcomes. And in the 8th, uh, you've got Dale County, Coffee County, Covington, um, lots of deserter bands down there. But you've also got Pike County and Barber County and Henry County, which are gung ho for the war. Uh, so that so the, the, the district was divided. This last one here, this is Mobile, uh, largely around Mobile. James Dickinson is a, a, a states' rights fire eating Democrat from Clark County. Uh, he will prevail with a plurality against his challenger. This guy, Hall, is. You know, I don't really know much about him. He's from Baldwin County. I don't know what he was running for. He doesn't do well. But Langdon, Charles Langdon, was the former mayor of Mobile. 
he challenges Dickinson. Uh, Dickinson wins. It's a plurality, but which might, and, and one would say, just looking at it casually, it's like, okay, Dickinson was pro-war, but he only got a plurality, so the Ninth District is shaky. When you study who Langdon is, you find out not really. Langdon is, is pro-war. Both of these guys were competing on who was more pro-war than the other. Langdon went so far, he was getting hyperbolic. He issued the black flag, which was an expression during the war of calling for no mercy on the enemy. Langdon, Langdon was wanting the Confederate Army to execute Union prisoners. Uh, that was his way of showing, I'm really for the Confederacy, so much so that I want every single Yankee we come across to be killed. Okay, he does not win, but Dickinson's reliable on the war too. So in the end, uh, eight going going into it, eight uh, eight Alabama congressmen were definitely pro-war, with Smith the outlier. Six remain pro-war afterward, um, and continue and continue to support total war policies as as you press on. Again, quick sweep there. Uh, now the gubernatorial race. We'll keep this keep keep moving along here. I, I charge myself up with coffee because I gotta I gotta maintain the tempo. The gubernatorial race. This one gets a lot more coverage than the others, as governor races often do. Uh, legislative races are far more obscure and difficult to follow, and usually have politicians that 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 don't garner much attention. But the gubernatorial race is an important one. This is going to pit uh, the incumbent John Gill Shorter against his challenger, uh, who will ultimately win it, Thomas Hill Watts. And then the third candidate is James Dowdle. I, I put him down here. Uh, this is, a, as, I, I, as you can see here, it's a, another one of these cases of pro-war versus pro-war. Uh, a casual reading of the record would suggest that because Watts won and we all know that Shorter was pro-war, that that means that, that the, the governor was, was, of Alabama was not as committed. That, that's, that's a misleading conclusion. Uh, John Gill Shorter is undeniably pro-war. He was a fire eater, also from the Eufaula Regency, uh, state rights fire eater before the war. When one looks at Confederate governors, and I'm trying to remember how many there were over the course of the war, 34 or 36, um, John Gill Shorter ranks as probably the most dedicated and reliable war governor that Jefferson Davis as president can look to for support. John Gill Shorter willingly, with alacrity, enforces all of the total war policies at the state level. Uh, he, he, is, he is totally committed. Uh, a quote that I'll read from him, among many that I found that captures his, his uh, style. Um, he's responding to some complaints coming out of uh, the Tennessee River Valley and he issued this letter in which one of the quotes is, individual, local, and sectional interests, however great and important, must be held subordinate to the grand idea of Confederate success. If the Confederacy fails, all is lost. Shorter has no clemency or mercy with anyone that's not willing to go all out for the war effort. Uh, he's a a humorless man. Uh, he's he's very stern. He has very little personality and very little public appeal, uh, and that accounts in part for why he's going to lose so badly. It's not so much because everyone's opposed to what he's doing. There is a, a, a general agreement that the, these war policies are necessary, but it's his maladroit and dispassionate enforcement of them that grates on a lot of people's nerves. He's reviled. Everyone respects his, his, his patriotism and his dedication, but he's reviled for his, 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 his draconian approach to enforcing things. Instead, the voters... Whoops, the, the, the voters clearly go for, for Watts. I mean, it's a crushing victory. Watts obliterates uh, Shorter at the polls. And these two guys that actually run against each other in 1861, with Shorter winning back then, Shorter got 37,000 votes, and Watts got about 28,000. Uh, 1863, Shorter's voters are gone. Maybe they're in the army, maybe they're dead. Maybe they've, they're disillusioned by him and just, just can't bring themselves to vote for Watts. Whatever the case may be, Watts wins. But Watts is pro-war, too. Just because Shorter loses doesn't mean that the governor's seat is now in the hands of the, of the Peace Society. Even though members of the Peace Society were privately hoping that Watts might mm, kind of, you know, see the, be, be rational and see the futility of continuing the struggle, um, uh, 
they all know that he's where he stands. He was at the time of the election the Attorney General of the Confederacy and had arrogated to himself the unofficial power of interpreting the Confederate Constitution. There was no Supreme Court, uh, national Supreme Court in the Confederacy. There are state Supreme Courts, but there's no national Supreme Court. There's only two branches of government in the Confederacy. And so Watts, as the Attorney General, said, well, if, if we don't have a, you know, justices that can interpret the Constitution, I will. And uh, he interprets the laws very favorably toward a pro-war uh, position, particularly conscription, where he, come, he came out uh, when there was some question at the state level about the constitutionality of conscription, uh, Watts issued a ruling in which he said, yes, it's constitutional, it's necessary, it will be carried out. And a guy like Shorter's like, you got it. Now I will carry it out. Uh, they run against each other. Watts wins. Now, again, looking when you, when you analyze this, it's not so much a difference of substance between the men, but there is a big difference of style. Um, and again, the Peace Society was secretly hoping that maybe Watts would, would, would lean peace. They knew they weren't going to get anything from Shorter, so if they're going to vote for either one, Dowdle's the third man that nobody takes seriously here. Um, they go with Watts. But Watts is, Watts is a <clears throat> war man all over. Uh, and a quote, that he, a quote of his that I'll, I'll read to you that, that is in, in substance similar to the one I read about Shorter, after uh, Watts wins the election, he went he went uh, around the state giving kind of a pep rally to a pep rally talk to a war weary state, and he said at one stop, "If I had the power, I would build up a wall of fire between Yankeedom and the Confederate States, there to burn for ages as a monument of the folly, wickedness, and vandalism of the Puritanic race." Anybody that thought he might lean peace before, okay, he has pretty much said, no, we are fighting this thing to the end. No negotiation, independence or destruction. Is, is nothing, there's nothing, no other honorable course of action. Um, personality plays a big part, style more so than substance. I've made the case that, that John Gill Shorter is a, is a humorless individual, a fanatic, really, for the Confederacy. Watts comes across as a little more level-headed, definitely committed to the war, but seems, it seems to have a greater appreciation of the suffering of the people, uh, promises to try to help alleviate their concern you know, as, as much as possible without undermining the war effort, brings some relief, at least express some compassion and sympathy for the hardship that the people are going through. His nickname was Big Tom. He's known as a very affable, gregarious individual. Uh, the two together are, are polar opposites in their personality. Both are committed Confederates, uh, but the people look at Watts and they're like, he say, he, at least he says he cares about us. Shorter doesn't seem to care other than just winning the war. And then poor old Dowdle, commander of the 37th Infantry, um, which was fighting around Vicksburg at the time, or had fought at Vicksburg and was, was uh, part of the defeat there. He gets a few votes around Macon County, which is where he's from. Uh, but even together, uh, they don't come close to Watts. All right. The legislative race. This is just going to be the most cursory coverage here. 133 seats out of the 52 counties in the state. All I can do here is summarize uh, some of my overall findings, even though this also gets a full chapter of coverage. If there's an anti-war sentiment that, that, that comes through with, with any kind of meaningful success in the course of the, of the elections of 1863, it can be found in the legislative races. You know, the governor is going to be pro-war. The majority, uh, two-thirds of the, of the congressional delegation is pro-war. But at the House or the, the Assembly, uh, there is, there is a, a very meaningful anti-war or pro-peace, a nicer way of putting it, uh, element. Uh, within within the polity of Alabama, not in the Senate. I mean, the Senate is overwhelmingly pro-war, uh, and their leader in the Senate is Thomas Walker, a big slaveholder from Calhoun County, which uh, the name befits the the pro-war status of that county. It used to be called uh, Benton County, but uh, Benton was not uh, his political heritage is not strong enough on on a pro-slave position, so we'll rename it after the South Carolina nullifier. Uh, and then uh, in the, the P 
peace leader in the Senate is William Garrett from Coosa County. The Coosa River Valley, uh, which was Talladega, included in part of Talladega, part of the uh, uh, the district that upended um, um, Curry. Uh, there, there, uh, so there's some anti-war sentiment there, but heavily outnumbered. In the House, however, it's real tight. Uh, there, there, there's room for the peace movement. Is, is, to do to try to accomplish something to maybe stall the war effort or make their position uh, better known uh, it's still controlled by the pro war if you go across uh, all of the all of the uh, counties particularly in the slaveholding regions pro war politicians have a working majority in the house led by the speaker of the house Walter Crenshaw a slaveholder from Butler County and you can see here he's former Whig uh, and we got a former so it doesn't matter former Democrat former Whig former Democrat former Whig uh, the, the, the 1850 affiliations are not insignificant. They're they're informative, but they are. But but that is not what's driving the political thinking in 1863. Uh, it's it's. Do we want to win the war or do we want to cut our losses? Uh, Crenshaw wants to win the war. But Lewis Parsons is the leader in the House, and uh, he's a, a rising figure, uh, definitely affiliated with the Peace Society. Um, even though it's an unofficial, quasi-secretive movement, uh, he, he does not disguise his, his uh, sympathies for it. Uh, he will, after the war, be the provisional governor of Alabama during Reconstruction under Andrew Johnson. But at the time, he's, he's kind of the, the, the pro-peace leader. Uh, these are their strength areas. Despite this uh, closeness, and incidentally, these, these numbers are not too dissimilar to the vote on secession in 1861, uh, where, you, where the, you know, Alabama was, you know, 61 voted for secession, 39 against it. It's not too far off the mark, and the regions are not too far off the mark either. But despite this, my findings when I look at, the, at what the legislature does after the election is I find that it's... It's not just pro-war numerically, but it, it's pro-war in policies and resolutions that are put forth. One of the first things that the assembly does is it, uh, it enacts a militia act, <clears throat> which fully completes the mobilization of Alabama's manpower for the war effort. <clears throat> After the militia acts pass, vir there's virtually no Alabama male who's not assigned some kind of role for the Confederacy, either as a volunteer in the army, a conscript in the army, a member of the militia, uh, an, an overseer, uh, which, which you know, to provide kind of police control over, over the, uh, or they called them um, agriculturalists, uh, control over the slave population, or war-related industries. Um, had the anti-war group been opposed to furthering the war, they should have resisted this, but the, uh, but the Militia Act passed 69 to 11, and Parsons voted for it himself. Uh, despite the anti-war sentiments, there was an understanding that you know, we, we, can't, we, we really can't just fold over here, roll over here. Uh, similarly, in the same legislature, uh, our session, pushed forth a resolution calling for the use of slaves in the army. Alabama is ahead of the curve here uh, in the debate over whether the Confederacy should use its chattel, its slaves, for in, in the military. Uh, impressment uh, certainly used them for construction purposes, building railroads and fortifications, but they weren't put in the army. Uh, Alabama uh, legislature, including Parsons, in a 67 to 13 vote, uh, call for Congress to take measures to legally um, enroll African American slaves into the Confederate military in some role, either as, uh, more formally as Teamsters or something, but maybe even soldiers. And then they also passed a number of nationalistic resolutions that do not sound anti-war at all. Um, they resolutions calling for pledging all the resources of the state. You know, never submit to abolition rule because you know, that, that's what. Lincoln's going to do, emancipate the slaves, and neither group wants the slaves emancipated. If there's one thing that kind of rallies them together, it's any time you bring up the issue of slavery, you can get solidarity among, among, the, among the camps. And then the uh, paramount duty is to support the soldiers. Okay, I'm running out of time here. Um, I'll just show you that real quick. Uh, I, don't, I can't break that down. Uh, the state legislatures vote for senators. So the legislature that was elected in 1863 then proceeded to elect senators. 
Um, William Yancey died in the summer, and so his seat was open, and it went to Robert Jemison, who was definitely uh, hesitant about secession, um, but he's a reliable pro-war senator, perhaps not as gung-ho and enthusiastic as someone like Pugh or, or, or Lyon or Curie, or Curry, uh, but, but, but uh, definitely uh, opposed to any kind of peace talk. Uh, then the other seat, Clay, Clement Clay, was the sitting senator from Madison County. Uh, he sought re-election in November 1863, and there was this really drawn-out uh, process. And when I, when I talk about who's pro-war and who's pro-peace, it's this election here that actually provides me most of my data, because that's like a Rosetta Stone for who's who in the Alabama legislature. Because anybody voting for Clay is definitely pro-war or anybody voting for Curry, who also sought, you know, after losing the congressional seat, thought he'd get a Senate seat, he's definitely pro-war. And then this guy, Jacob Siebels, or Siebels, uh was a former colonel in the 6th Alabama. He's a military man, but he's opposed to the war. And he's a member of the Peace Society. Everyone knows this. And so anyone voting for Siebels is definitely against the war. And this is the vote. This is how I can, uh, as close as possible, come down to who's who in the House or in the, in the legislature based on this senatorial vote. And you see you've got consistent, this is an average between the first 11 ballots, Clay getting about 32, Curry getting about 34. Collectively, that's about 66 pro-war uh, legislators who just can't agree on which of the pro-war men to elect. And then Seibel's consistently pulls down 44, 44, 45, 46, 44. And they're deadlocked. Seibel's has dropped. Fitzpatrick, uh, an old former governor of the state, is brought forward as a, you know, he's kind of lukewarm on the war. Uh, maybe pull some, some of these guys over. That does work. Uh, the pro-war camp drops Clay, rallies around Curry. Still no, no, no definitive breakthrough. Uh, had these six war pro-fringe thrown in with Curry, Curry would have won. Didn't happen. So you get to the 20th ballot. And finally, the pro-war camp gets, around, gets behind uh, Richard Walker, who's not gung-ho for the war, but he's a reliable uh, Confederate. And that finally pushed him over the, over the edge. Uh, historians sometimes look at this and say, well, Walker was a former Whig, lukewarm on the war. Curry and Clay didn't win, so this shows that the Senate seat went for somebody against the war. No, almost all the pro-war camp vote for Walker. Almost all the anti-war camp vote for Fitzpatrick. The anti-war politicians did not want Walker, but he ended up becoming the, the senator. And so both of them are, with qualifications, more or less pro-war. All right. The last thing, and, and I'm going to skip over this. I will just say it as fast as I can because I got to stop and let, give some time for questions. Um, missing in action is the soldier vote. I devote a chapter to this as well. Uh, they're disfranchised by the Article 3, Section 5 of the 1861 State Constitution, which stipulates that a, a citizen must be in his home county three months three consecutive months prior to the election. There's no way Confederate soldiers can be sitting at home for three months prior to the 1863 election when they're at the front. Officially, there are 72,000 uh, Alabamians had gone through the military at this point in time. Actually on duty uh, at the time of the elections, about 29,000, of which that's about 40%. Uh, which is pr pretty consistent. Uh, historians, by 1863, regiments are only at about 40% strength. Eligible to vote, that means 21 and older. Out of that 29,000 is 17,000. Uh, and then those with pro-war proclivities is about 80%. Now, this might sound like an arbitrary figure I pulled out of thin air. Uh, to a certain extent, it is. I don't, I don't have proof of that it's 80% pro-war, but I'm basing it off other elections where soldiers did vote and the percentages we do know. Uh, Alabama didn't allow soldiers to vote, but North Carolina did, and in their election, state elections, 88% of the soldiers voted for pro-war candidates. Georgia allowed their soldiers to vote, and 75% of them voted for pro-war candidates. And of course, in the 1864 election, when Lincoln is, wins, Union soldiers vote, and 78% vote for a candidate who's pro-war. Soldiers north and south 
wanted pro-war politicians to the tune of three-fourths to four-fifths. And so this is the, a, a figure I work with. I'm, uh, I'm surmising that Alabama is not much different than North Carolina or Georgia. They're going to be for the war. And if you weave them into the election, which I'd try to, I, I've got a breakdown by county of, of, of all the eligible soldiers, and if 80% of them by county are voting, you get some different outcomes. Curry defeats Kruikshank. Fowler defeats Smith. Seven extra war, pro-war guys who lose in the state races win, and that tips the scale in the senatorial race, which perhaps lets Clay win because Curry would have already been a congressman. Speculative, but informative, nonetheless, putting, putting, putting the paucity of voter returns into perspective. So I close with, with this, my last slide. Was Alabama a, quote, war state all over? That's the tentative title of my work. Uh, that I, and, and it's a question I, I pose. Was it, a, based on this election, to what extent can we determine that coming out of the election, Alabama remained pro-war, a war state? Alabama's polity, that is the office holders, military personnel, newspaper editors, uh, and that narrow band of the electorate, the polity, yes, is pro-war. Certainly some misgivings, some angst, but pro-war, undeniably. The society, however, I cannot draw conclusions for Alabama society at large. So this election is limited in, in, the, in the overall conclusions you can make about Alabama. Because blacks, slaves, are 45% of the population. They, of course, don't weigh in. They're not allowed to vote. No, and, and, and the white power structure doesn't care what their opinion is. Even though it's probably pretty, strong, like, and pretty strongly anti-Confederate. If they could have voted, they probably would have tossed these guys out if they could. White women don't vote. Although there's, and based on other, other letters and things, a lot, of, a lot of white women were, based on their rhetoric, pro-war. But a lot of them weren't. A lot of them wanted their men to come home, uh, wanted the suffering to end. I can't really gauge that. Certainly not with an election where they're not allowed to participate. And male civilians, the yeomanry, that's a mixed bag. A lot of them did want to keep fighting. A lot of them didn't. Uh, a lot of them didn't even vote. So it's, it's hard. Nevertheless, as far as the elections are concerned, as far as Alabama, Alabama as a polity is concerned, the state remains politically committed to the rebellion right to the bitter end. I will stop there and take questions. that wonderful presentation. We have uh, time for some questions now, so if you want to raise your hand, uh, Georgia Ann and I will bring the microphones around to you so you can ask your question. Uh, my question, Ben, is on the elections, the district, like District 4, where it was a little bit anti-slavery. Was it more a moral objection that they voted or was it based that there were no slaves in that area and it was monetarily so they didn't see any need to fight? Well, there's a lot of slaves in the 4th District. Uh, not, not as many as the Black Belt region of the Tennessee River Valley, but, but certainly there's slaves. Um, Curry is a planter. He owns 40 slaves. He's from, from that district. Uh, it's, and it's not a moral question either. Uh, the, the morality of slavery is, is rarely, rarely debated. And there, are, there are plenty of yeoman or non-slaveholding Alabamians that resent the planter class, the slaveholding class, because of their socio-political status and power. Um, but very few white Alabamians have any moral misgivings about the institution, of, the necessity of the institution of slavery. And whenever that, the threat of slavery, the threat to the institution is brought up, you'll see a, a lot of near consensus on the part of Alabamians to try to pro-war and anti-war. The anti-war has more to do with the... The concern there is actually uh, that fighting the war is, is, is the worst thing to do for slavery uh, because the Union Army is going to conquer the South. 
and destroy it, and then after 1863, emancipate the slaves. And what, what you see guys like Parsons and some of the other, uh, Cruikshank in, the, in, in Congress, is they were, they're, it never gets off the ground, but there's hope that maybe if the peace movement can get control of the political establishment in the Confederacy, perhaps there could be a ceasefire negotiation with the Lincoln administration where if he doesn't drop the issue of emancipation, at least he'll relegate uh, race relations to a state rights issue, which is a de facto way of, of retaining control of African Americans. Uh, so even the pro-war and the, the pro-war definitely will protect the institution through inst independence. The anti-war crowd is like the war is going to destroy the institution unless we wrap this thing up as quickly as possible. Uh, I don't know if I, I know there were some other parts of your question there. Uh, the districts, the 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 reason why the fourth has a, a lot of. It, it's more to do with the strength of the secession sympathies. In 1861, um, the counties of, of the 4th District sent a lot of so-called co-op, they were, well not so-called, they were called cooperationists who went to the convention and were going to vote for secession only if the rest of the South uh, cooperated with Alabama. Um, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily opposed to the idea of a confederacy. They just don't think it's a wise thing to do. It's The timing is terrible, and that if the North goes for a total war, the South is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to ask a question about uh, the soldier candidates you mentioned and how they sort of publicly justified their availability to run for office when it seems like if they were qualified for office, and a soldier, they'd be better served, better uh, served being at the front. And how? So, what? How do they deal with that issue in the public discourse surrounding this election? It, the newspapers, you soldiers, and they're almost always officers who had political aspirations, would make their candidacy available through the newspapers. Uh, and then try to garner garner some local support. They, you know, a surrogate locally would, would try to promote them. Um, this was the case with Sheffield. There were a number of other uh, military officers who were solicited by by uh, from their home districts by pro-war uh, folks who wanted them to run. But as for the point you're, you the very point you made, they preferred serving at the front. Um, uh, what's the, the guy from Henry County? I'm drawing a blank. He was the, he led the 15th Alabama at Little 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 Round Top. Um, wow, this is a terrible name to forget here. Somebody help me here. You know, he was later governor of the state. Lost an arm. Wow, I'm giving all kinds of detail, but except except the name. Uh, he was asked to run, uh, and he said no. He was going to the, the more honorable service was to fight the enemy at the front. Not, not in the halls of, of, of a legislative hall. And there was also Isham Garrett, who was a, a, an officer in the Confederate Army fighting at Vicksburg, who was asked. Uh, his, his men wrote home and tried to curry, get locals to put his name forth. He said, no, I want to stay with, with the soldiers. And he was killed in action before the election. So a lot of, there are a lot of potential officer candidates who begged off because, as you pointed out, they put military service above political service and that there were, but those that did made their names known through the newspapers but it was usually very late in the game uh, and whether they would have gotten enough support anyway it was it was kind of a last last minute kind of thing everybody knew uh, who the front runners were going to be going into these elections with the soldiers kind of coming in when they went especially Sheffield when he was worried when Cobb was running Sheffield was like okay this guy is probably going to win because Rawls is a is a is a he's a he's a strong pro-war politician, but he, he had no charisma, and so Sheffield's like, you know, a real man needs to take this guy on. But it's too late in the game, too late in the in the, in the season. And I use that real man just he didn't really say that. That's but 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 he's a warrior. Rawls was not. Okay. Yes, um, you had mentioned one of your first slides about the eligibility or eligible voters uh, was about 114,000 right there. So my curiosity question was, obviously the numbers were greater in the gubernatorial race in 1861. Were the percentages still about the same as far as voter turnout? And was it easier to vote in 1861 versus well, since the war was going on? Well, yeah, I mean, the war certainly has a disruptive effect. Um, that 114 is the ideal world. You're never going to get all of them going forward. But in the 1860 election, which is 
where a lot of this number is derived from. About 80 or 78 to 80 percent of the electorate voted in that election. I mean, Lincoln was was running, and and uh, and Alabama, you know, voted for either Breckenridge, Douglas, or, or um, Bell. They uh, an, 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 non-Republican. So that was a big turnout with that one. 1861 in the gubernatorial race, uh, the percentage, I don't, I don't know, it was about 56-58% about voted in the governor's race, about 46% voted in the congressional race, and then we have this drop-off. And a lot of that is, the, the war has an, has an effect, the destructive quality of the war. There are some districts in the Tennessee River Valley where the voter returns were erratic and sketchy, and in Franklin County were dismissed entirely because uh, a lot of the polls didn't even open. Uh, and you also have a, a you know, ten to 15,000 are killed or dead. They've died and died in the in the service. And then there's just the dis, there's disruption. It's still it's still a low number. Um, more could have voted, but a lot did not. And so I don't know if it's apathy or, or, or resignation, fatalism. Uh, they just don't participate. But it is it is a big drop off. And so it's something else I have to use as a qualifier when I'm making conclusions about what this election says about the pro-war sympathies in, in Alabama. Is this, it's a narrow slice of a narrow slice. Well, we're going to have one more question. The gentleman in the middle here is going to ask it. But Dr. Severance has assured me that he's going to stay after. So if you have any more questions, you can come up and ask him after. Uh, do you get any sense that uh, events of the war had any sort of impact? Uh, as, as I look at it, 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 it seems that, that the answer is no, but you know, I, I realize they didn't know whether Gettysburg was a loss or not. I mean, they knew it was a horrible battle, but Vicksburg falling would seem to be, would lead some to think that this thing may not be winnable. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, events do impinge, which is why I made the point that this is a, a really bad time to hold an election. Um, had, had you held it in, in May, where the Confederacy is fresh off its Chancellorsville victory, um, who knows what the outcome would be. But uh, yeah, you're right. The, the, the qualifier for Gettysburg is very, you're quite right. Everyone knows it's a vicious battle, but uh, the, so soon after Gettysburg, it wasn't entirely clear how, how devastating that was. And letters coming out of Alabama soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia, they're writing home saying, don't worry about that, okay. Uh, we win most of our battles. We're gonna, we're gonna, we'll win the next one. Don't throw in the towel. Uh, they can't vote, but they're writing home saying, "Don't let this. This is an aberration. This is not. Uh, Vicksburg is is. Everyone recognizes that as a catastrophe for the for the Confederacy. Uh, you've lost Louisiana, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas are cut off. The Mississippi is lost. The garrison has been, has been has been taken, although it was paroled. Uh, a lot of those Vicksburg soldiers ended up back in the Confederate Army. Uh, but this is a, a clear-cut defeat uh, that 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 weighed over the election. Uh, and there and you do there are some uh, letters of, uh, pointing out that this is this is bad news. Uh, from some soldiers, but they're also saying it doesn't matter. This is a terrible loss, but as as Benner said, can't stop. They're not going to stop. We can't stop. So yes, this is this is bad, but don't don't, don't be disheartened. If, and there's still the Confederacy still has a viable chance of winning. And later on in, in my study, I point out the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, which comes in September, after the a month after the election, that's a Confederate victory, and you see this morale boost uh, where where some of these politi pro-war politicians are saying, "See, we can still win this thing. Let's, we can still." And, and the anti-war crowd is kind of silenced for a while. But this, you know, events are important. Uh, it's it's some, and, and this and, and of the two, this is this is definitely the one that bothers bothers most Alabamians. Uh, and then all these have a, a, a varying degree of, of discontent. Uh, but most of the politicians stand by, stand by those total war policies. Thank you, Dr. Severance. Can we all just have another round of applause? <laughs>